Dr. Future is such a great and wonderful uh, believer, you know, very mild mannered, can deal with criticism, is willing to change his views on things, and, and really to kind of go where the evidence leads. It was a very constructive, constructive thing on many levels, and, and you know, he came, you know, he's kind of come to be my greatest, my closest friend. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I, I cherish and value that, that. I cherish and value both the education, but I also cherish and value the, the friendship just as much, you mm-hmm. know. He's just a wonderful, wonderful guy. I, I appreciate Mike Bennett's command of scripture. I mean, he just always comes yeah. back to the Bible, and that's like the most important thing ever. So, um, how exactly did you meet Mike? We started going to the same church, and he, I remember, the way that I remember it is that he, like, flat out just walked up to me after I'd been going there for a couple months and said, Hey, do you want to come to a radio show? I do a radio show. <laughs> and and it, was, it was almost, for me, it was almost a little bit off putting. He, you know, he wants to go and do this radio show, and I said, okay. Uh, so I went up there and started doing it, and he said, anytime you want to do it, we'll do it. And I said, okay, let's do it. I'll do it again next week. And he was like, I, I, I don't think he was prepared for me to say, I'll do it again next week. Yeah. And so I ended up doing it again the next week and then taking a couple weeks off and then doing it again next week. And then he said, then, then he said well, anytime you want to do it, just come do it. And I said, okay, how about I just do it all the time? <laughs> you know? And so then it was kind of born, it was kind of born out of that way. And for me, it ended up being just an incredible, incredible experience, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, one, a formative one in my life. So it was good, you know, five years of doing that future quake stuff with talking with, with experts left me with many, many different views and a and sort of a re-education, if you will. Yeah, of unlearning. Uh, yeah, on, on, on lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different uh, issues. Yeah, so, okay, so, so at the time that you were doing that with Mike, uh, you, you, were you at the actual radio station, or did you guys do this, like, you, you pre-record them somewhere else, or how did that all work? We started at a radio station. They had a local... Uh, WRFN, it was a local public access station, and Mike started this radio, sh- Mike just started doing the radio show, he saw an ad in the newspaper, they were looking for interesting shows, and as all these guys who were just super new agey, yeah. and, and uh, Mike was like, well, I want to do one about Christian prophecy, <laughs> and, and, and so that didn't, you know, that, that was sort of the odd man, he was kind of the odd man out on that one, Yeah. Um, but he started doing it, and there was another another guy who also he's starting to go to our church now. The guy that I replaced, Emmett, the yeah. host Emmett. Yeah, he's he goes to our church now too. And uh, uh, he and Emmett did it for a while, and then and then Emmett had had some job changes and so couldn't do it any longer. And then that's what Mike got me involved. It was just a good it was a good thing. Uh, so we did it on WRFN for a couple of about a year or two, I guess. <laughs> And then we did it out of Mike's, out of Mike's back room, for the remainder of it. And for I think two of those four years, it was on W E N O, okay, which was a local radio station in in Nashville here. And they put us on at drive time, so I thought that was a weird, you know, you figure we'd be on at like nighttime. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. two in the morning or something. But no, sure. they put us on. You know, if I would leave work early. The job I was working at the time, if I would leave work a little bit early, uh, I could sit and listen to myself five days a week talking about this or that or whatever on um, WENO, 6.50 a.m. Well, WENO eventually got sold, and after it got sold, we just went Internet only. We did that for a while, and then it kind of got to the point where it was just, it was time. You know, we had, we had done all we needed to do and all we could do, and it was time to... Uh, kind of call it quits, basically, and so we did. And Mike is now working on his books, and I am now working working in a different uh, different capacity, different ministry capacities. Yeah, yeah. You were saying something about that. What what uh, what are you doing exactly? Well, good question. I am working at the Nashville Rescue Mission. I'm working at a local rescue mission. I'm not supposed to. 
I guess I signed, there was some new media policy where I'm not supposed to kind of say where I work. Okay. But I work at a, I work at a rescue mission here. Okay. Uh, it's a pretty large one. And I'm the, currently the director of case management there, and I oversee about uh, eight or nine folks. And we, we talk about all sorts of stuff, and we're trying to reach kind of the people, uh, it's kind of the worst of the worst, you might say, people who are really in crisis uh, with, with the gospel. Uh, so that is a, that's something that it takes, you know, much more than just full-time uh, hours. Yeah. Uh, I'm also on staff at a church. I'm, I'm on staff at Calvary Chapel Rivergate there. Uh, I was recently commissioned as a minister of the gospel. And the commissioning is like being a pastor, except our, our particular church kind of tends to reserve being a pastor. Uh, they only ordain people as pastors who are serving at the church, at our, at our church. While they are very sympathetic and encouraging uh, to other, other folks who are serving in different capacities outside of our church, they, they only ordain people as pastors who are serving at the, at the church there, specifically. Mm-hmm. And so uh, uh, the way it was explained to me, at least, it's like being a pastor, except you don't serve at the church. Right. At, 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 you don't serve as a pastor at this church right now. Okay. And, is, what, uh, what, kind of, what kind of denomination is it? It's a, well, it's a cavalry chapel, and, and cavalry chapels are, they grew out of all the, all the hippies and stuff that got saved out on the West Coast okay. uh, in the 60s and 70s. A guy, named, a guy named Chuck Smith was part of the Foursquare Gospel and uh, just kind of left that movement and started a, started a church where they just did a, had a really simple basic service. The worship music, announcements and then verse-by-verse verse Bible teaching. Hmm. And and that was it. And then, like, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people got saved out there on the West Coast who were part of... It was like a revival, almost. Mm-hmm. Um, people got saved, you know. Tens of thousands of people came to Christ from pretty bad and ridiculous and ugly backgrounds in California at that time. The church got so big. when the When the movement first started... The church quickly outgrew its building within a couple of couple of years, so they built a bigger building, and then, you know, a year later they were, they went to three services and they had, you know, two thousand. They were out. They've out. out they had outgrown the two thousand seat place that they had there. Wow. And they said, well, it's time for us to build a bigger building. And he said, no, it's time for y'all to start going and plant your own churches. Huh. Cool. And, and so. He started taking people under his wing and, and mentoring them and sending them out to start their own churches. And so now, I think there's probably about 1,500 cavalry chapels worldwide, and they all they all follow the same basic premise where there's a time of worship, and then there's announcements and stuff, uh, and then the, the sermon is almost always a verse-by-verse study of some book of the Bible. Well, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, it's very, in that sense, it's very straightforward. It's very focused. Uh-huh. The idea is, is if you keep teaching out of the Word of God, people will keep, will keep consuming it, and it, it tends to make them, it tends to make them, um, it, it also tends to make them healthy, because you as a pastor can't, you can't preach on your same, the same ten things you want to preach about. Right. And, and kind of go to your same ten places you like in the Bible, you have to take you have to take it all into account. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, for instance, I've just noticed that, like, a lot of churches, they preach, it almost seems like a prepackaged kind of, like, eight-week or seven-week, like, sermon-type of deal. And yep. and it's really annoying. Like, it's very vague, and they just pull a bunch of verses from a bunch of different places for each mm-hmm. one. And I like that idea where you're just going through God's Word as is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let the text kind of speak for itself. Mm-hmm. So that's a big thing. It's been much. It's been a little bit maligned lately because it is a. It's part of the. They they believe in the gifts. Now they, as a general rule, they don't. It's funny. They have kind of an odd way of the gifts. They believe in the gifts. They believe that God still does miracles of healing and and all of those things. But they are. Those are for for evangelism and for equipping and and those type of things. And so. 
generally you never ever ever see them in in a worship service or anything like that uh, in fact you know the Bible's pretty straightforward is that they're not supposed to cause a disruption so if somebody you know if somebody's in a church or, or whatever um, it's never happened in our church but I would imagine if somebody just started speaking loudly in tongues and there was nobody to interpret they would probably send they, they'd end up probably sending me they'd probably send me to, to tell them to stop like look wow. this isn't this isn't whatever you're doing you know nobody's here interpreting so this isn't tongues and you need to quit right and so they they are they are what's called continuationists but they also don't they don't believe that it should be in any way disrupting you know nobody's going to stand up in the middle and, and and freak out and yeah or anything like that you know it's very it's very non pentecostal <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, very. It's very pro. It's very pro gifts, but very non Pentecostal. There you go. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I I had listened to the Doctor Future uh, interview a few months ago on Canary Cry Radio, and uh-huh. you guys got a bunch of people uh, that are kind of like minded at your church too. I guess right, like Chris Pinto uh-huh. goes to your church too. Yeah, yeah, he's there. He's not. I, I, he's not there every Sunday, but uh, but I think that he attends our church regular. Well, I know he attends our church regularly, and I think that he considers it his home, his home church. Yeah. So, but Chris Pinto's there, and um, just uh, there, you know, there's a tight knit group of about ten or so folks that kind of think, think the way that we do more or less. Yeah. That's a that's a helpful thing. Yeah. You know, to, to be able to go in and be able to kind of be uplifted by by each other when when times are tough yeah and and it's good because then if there's 10 of you you have somebody to kind of pump the brakes too if you're going a little off the deep end you know so yeah and that's and that's that's happened once or twice too you know you know it's like hey bro you need to you need to not read that book now you need to get yeah. back to reading the bible right now yeah <laughs> okay so we're kind of in the present now but mm-hmm. i kind of just want to time travel a little bit more backward uh, mm-hmm. to your uh, I guess ex- experience with or your uh, how, how you came into the whole like sleep paralysis study because I know that you did all that research with Chris White um, for mm-hmm. that for that book so um, and we just did an episode with Chris mm-hmm. uh, like specifically on the book so we don't have to elaborate on everything that we just covered with Chris, but it would just be kind of interesting to hear your thoughts on sleep paralysis and, and how you kind of came into to knowing about that. Well, Chris and I were talking. I have to credit credit Chris White. We lived together for a time, he and I, and would go out and do different things, and he was talking about it one time, and I kind of looked it up, and, and I, I think I sort of made some vague offhand comment, like, somebody should start a ministry to help these people. And he's like... You should, and I'll put the website up. And and before uh, before I really had much of a chance to do it, you know, to really think about it, there's a website up, and I'm the new expert of sleep paralysis. And so I would I would answer emails and help and stuff, and just I just basically I gradually got too busy to do it. Uh, and Chris had I don't know if he had more time on it, but he just saw it as more important, and so he ended up. Uh, he ended up taking it over some and doing a lot more with it. Obviously, publishing a book and all those and, studies too, right? I mean, yeah. Uh huh. So I didn't do. I mean, I just I answered emails. I spoke at a couple conferences about it. I I tried to help people end it, uh, but I didn't do. I mean, Chris Chris has taken it. You know, Chris has taken it forward here and, and is now doing something else with it. And I believe. I believe he's got a team. I don't know what's going on with it lately, but I but I believe there there's kind of a team of people now that work with that stuff. So, hmm. um, I just I did it for a little while until I just didn't have time to do it anymore. Chris was able to do something with it. So, did you have any people that you knew that were experiencing it, or you never had an experience yourself? Um, you know, I didn't have an experience of it until after I started the ministry. Really? Yeah, it was. It was it was really weird. I remember having that exact experience after helping a couple people who were really having a hard time. And I remember I was asleep on the couch 